You are here at the finale of the Genesis series. If you're just joining us, welcome. This is like sweeps week. This is it. This is the big season finale. How many of you were here back in August? We started this thing. Anybody? Yeah, all right, yeah. Those who persevere to the end will be saved. Now, if you... <laughs> You've come all the way to the end of the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 50 today. It's the end. This is the conclusion of this series. And one of the things that has been, the, one of the notes that has been struck over and over again in this book is that traditional religion won't cut it. By traditional religion, I mean, come on, guys. These are the heroes. Be like Joseph, right? Be, be like uh, Noah. Be like uh, Adam and so forth. Here are the heroes emulate the good behavior of the heroes and you'll be fine and you're realizing that there's no heroes in here these are deeply flawed individuals much like us right and so traditional religion and traditional legalism won't cut it it's not enough well here are the commands do these commands and you'll be fine it's not going to cut it the only hero in the book of genesis the only one who's truly the lord of all things the only hero is god and Genesis is about what God is doing in the lives of some messed up families, some dysfunctional people, how God is working for good. And another theme that has struck me in Genesis, and maybe uh, if you've been part of this series, is how, like in a world of unspeakable evil, how God can work things for good. I'll say it this way, often when God seems most silent is when he's most active and at work you look at the life, life of joseph you look at the, the 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 narrative saga that goes on in this guy's life and you see god is in the background working for good okay so we're going to wrap it up today as always i give a little bit of background you, if you were here last week or if you're not you know the story joseph's brothers who had betrayed him joseph eventually gets to egypt becomes you know great and powerful underneath pharaoh it set, resets the scene where Benjamin is sort of framed for a crime he didn't commit. And they can either leave Benjamin to die and go be free or Judas steps up. At any rate, at that moment, Joseph hits him with the unveiling. It's uh, like, sort of like the end of Scooby-Doo when they pull up the mat, only, only like, more important. But like Joseph, pull, it's like, guys, he's weeping, he's crying, they can't figure out. Finally, he's like, it's me! And they're like, brothers, got a hug, it's our broseph, long lost, he comes. They, they gather together, it's all reunited, everything's going to be good. Go back to the promised land, go get dad. Now dad's name is Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, right? That's the same guy. Israel's the name of a person, he has these 12 sons reunite go get them they bring them and pharaoh tells them what do you guys need you need land boom here's a bunch of land it's d dedicated just to you what do you guys do for a living you need jobs they're like well we're sheep herders perfect you can run my sheep you, you, you and because one thing pharaoh's learned about this family whatever joseph touches turns to gold so he's like by all means be in charge of the herds of sheep and they do and all these shepherds and if you're new to the bible and you've heard stories like the prince of Egypt, and you know and Mo Moses gets the God's people out of Egypt, right? And you wonder, how did they get in Egypt? This is how they got into Egypt in the first place. Israel, aka Jacob, his twelve sons, his twelve tribes, they get to Israel to avoid the famine because Joseph is has kind of got the hook up there with Pharaoh, and they get treated great, and that's how they get there. Now, spoiler alert: later they're going to have you know. Later, that Pharaoh will die, and a Pharaoh will arise who knoweth not Joseph. And then, you know, they, they get into trouble and have to be rescued out. But, but the point is, that's how they get to Egypt in the first place. So, all is well. They live, they should live uh, happily ever after. But then, old Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, uh, dies. And then it dawns on him. When Jacob dies, there's this moment after the burial where the brothers start thinking, Hmm, they think, Joseph, you know, our brother Joseph's been awfully good to us, and we've been awfully wicked to him. And they start thinking this through. They're going, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it maybe started right after the funeral. There was kind of this awkward moment, and they were like, uh, Reuben, come over here. Yeah, Simeon, yeah, Asher, yeah, Benjamin. Actually, no, Benjamin. No, 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 no. Uh, <clears throat> guys, you know what I'm thinking? What if... We have been the cause of a lot of pain in Joseph's life. Yeah, I've kind of thought of that. Remember how we uh, wanted to kill him, but then we sold him into slavery? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So, so terrible things have happened to Joseph because of us. You don't suppose. What if Joseph has only been nice to us out of honor for dad? I was kind of thinking that. Yeah. And like, what if he is waiting? As soon as dad dies, he's going to drop the hammer and give us what we all deserve. Like, Yo, I was kind of thinking that too. What if he's only been being nice to us out of respect and honor? So when he said a few months ago that he forgave us, what if he didn't really mean it and he was just doing that out of respect for Israel and like, this is going to get bad. Isn't that so true? Isn't that true that, 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 that calloused, hardened hearts have a very difficult time receiving free grace and forgiveness. Did you know that? Callous and hardened. You just can't believe that God's forgiveness is really forgiveness. The brothers, hardened and callous, they just can't believe that it is possible that Joseph would offer real forgiveness. Hardened, calloused people, it is very difficult to receive an offer of free grace. I know this uh, by experience. Uh, uh, um, so... <clears throat> In New York, we, we had this idea to do some like, you know, street evangelism, and if nothing else, just kind of get the word out about our church. We want to do something out of the box. So uh, we went to the subway train stop, the F train there, where the commuters in New York were coming, and we got there early in the morning uh, with uh, uh, free coffee and donuts for subway commuters in New York City. <clears throat> uh, uh, we went to Dunkin' Donuts at our own expense, and they had a little sticker. We put a sticker on the cup, and it just said, hey, have a great day, you know, free coffee, donuts on us, just be blessed, right? This is thousands of people going through, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, right? And I can tell you um, that hardened, calloused people have a hard time accepting free things. <laughs> can you imagine? So it's like it's absolutely free. And, and we went to Dunkin' Donuts, we got it and set it out, and people would walk by us. It was, like, it, was, it was like we were passing out the plague. It was incredible. People would look at us like, what's your angle? What's this? Like, nothing. God's love is free, and these donuts are free. Go ahead. I don't believe that for a second. Like, get right? It was unbelievable. Like, what do you mean something's free? Everything. We realized later, you can give out wrapped things, you can give out packs of gum, and you can give out sealed water bottles, but like free donuts and coffee, people were like, no, they can't be. What's your catch? One crazy guy came up to me. He goes, you from the church, right? I was like, yeah. And he says, uh, what's the deal with this? I was like, God's love's free, and we're trying to bless the community. I bet you got some sort of uh, hidden device that's going to track all of our movements and watch our choices, right? So what do you say to that? Well, one thing I've learned is you always double down on the crazy. So I leaned in and I said, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> and he walked off and I'm th I, I probably changed that man's life. I probably, you know, he, probably, he like changed the way he lived and everything because you always double down on the crazy. You never back away. Anyway, he's out there with his tinfoil hat. I know the truth. You, you can't give, right? Why? Callous, hardened people have a hard time accepting the free grace. It's impossible to believe that the love of God, or in this case, the love of Joseph. I was in India, and I heard this Indian pastor tell this story. It illustrates it perfectly. He tells it much better than I ever could. But he nails it. He says, uh, these two, this, this brother and sister, uh, this little boy and girl, were both given goodies. They were given treats by grandma. The girl was given a a bag of chocolates, uh, Hershey Kisses or something. And the, the little boy was given a bag of marbles. And so they both put them in their pocket and they're so excited. Now the boy didn't really want the marbles. He really, what he really wanted was the chocolates. And so he goes to the little girl and says, hey, will you, uh, will you trade me all those chocolates for all my marbles? And the girl thinks, actually, I'd, <clears throat> I'd rather have the marbles. Sure, I'll do that deal. He thinks, great. And he reaches in and he grabs all the marbles. But he, he puts, he puts, a couple marbles back and he pulls them all out he goes great great here you go and she takes the chocolates and gives them exchanges and he puts those chocolates and as they're walking away he looks back and he says hey did you give me all your chocolates and the point of that story it hit me it's like when we hold back don't we just naturally assume that everybody else is too it's like when we hold back, we would never, and so these brothers are going, we wouldn't be this way. Joseph, is it possible that maybe he's been holding back? Is it possible that forgiven really means forgiven? Maybe he hasn't been forgiving. Maybe he's been biding his time. So look at what they say in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Look at what the brothers huddle up. Verse 15, when Joseph saw that, the, excuse me, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, 
it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So, they sent a, mas a message to Joseph saying, uh, your father gave this command before he died. <laughs> now, look, you have an incredibly high view of human nature if you think that this story is not utterly fabricated by the brothers. Like, you are, you are very trusting and nice. I, there's no record of Jacob ever telling the boys, like, this is his deathbed. But the brothers are not stupid. They're like, listen, Joey, on his deathbed, his last words were, yo, be cool to my brothers, right? Don't kill them, right? So they say, this is the last thing. This is the command. Right before he died, we were there, and, and this is what he said, verse 17. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brother. This is your father's dying wish, Joey. This is all he wanted. <laughs> Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. That's what he said. I know. That's just all he wanted. <laughs> and now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. You see what Joseph's saying, right? He's like, I mean, you see what the brothers are saying. Look, look, dad just wanted to make sure we're, we're cool, right? Then it rests that verse says, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Now personally, I think he wept because he was so broken that his brothers did not fully trust his grace and forgiveness. He was broken over that. I mean, he thought that they were cool, that they had established that relationship. And suddenly he realized maybe these guys had further to go. His brothers, verse 18 says, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. If you're keeping track, last a week's sermon. What, remember he had the first dream. I'm going to be a, a stalk of wheat and all the brothers are going to bow down to me. Fulfilled in last week's message. And look, he had a second dream. Dream made. God's promise made. God's promise fulfilled. That's it. That's the fulfillment of the second dream. But Joseph said to them, this is incredible. So, so are you going to forgive us? I mean, are, are you going to hold a grudge? Joseph said to them, do not fear for am I in the place of of God, Derek Kidner says that this response sparkles with faith. He goes so far as to say that response, am I in the place of God? He calls it the summation of all Old Testament theology. For Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis to say, am I in the, am I in the place of God? How many of you remember way back in August, way back when we talked about the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve fell because they chose to be in the place of God. And here we come to the end of Genesis where you have a human being saying, whoa, 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 hold a grudge. Am I in the place of God? Now, if you're preaching a sermon on the Joseph saga, and I am, you might be tempted to focus on the more famous thing that he says. In fact, it's so famous, some of you have memorized it. Without showing the next slide, without even looking, can some of you uh, finish this phrase? Joseph looks to him, and looks to his brothers and says, what you meant for evil, God, there you go, you know this, okay, let's show it. God, well, you were intending this stuff for evil, but God meant it for good. As for you, verse 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now that, that's an incredible verse. And you know, th that's another sermon. W one day, we'll get to that one. But, but what Joseph is saying is, this is real evil. He doesn't belittle the fact that like what you did was truly evil. But when you were working all this evil, long before Romans 8 verse 28 was ever written, where Paul writes, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Long before that was ever written, Joseph sensed it, that God is working these things for good even though they're evil. And in this case, it brought about the salvation. So that's an incredible verse, and that I'm sure would be a, would be a great sermon. But for me... The power in this passage that really gives verse 20 its power, for me, the incredible comment is the one right before it, the one we just, the verse 19, am I in the place of God? That's the question for you this morning. That's the question that each of us have to wrestle with. If you're a note taker and you're like, I'm somebody who likes the big picture and I like to be able to jot it down, that's the point of today. Am I in the place of God? If you're not a note taker, but you like to remember the big chunk and the thrust of the message, that would be it. <laughs> am I in the place of God? Joseph asked, am I in the place of God? Let me ask it this way. <clears throat> <clears throat> A 
Are you sitting in God's chair this morning? One of the great things about being the child of a teacher, some of you are teachers, you have children. I, I, I'm a teacher's kid. Uh, it's great. One of the great things is my mom was a substitute teacher. One of the great things is that when you're the kid of a teacher, it's awesome. Because after everybody leaves for school, your mom is tidying some things up. And that means you, as a kid, get to explore the entire school. And you get to go into, other, into places and offices and rooms and closets that you have no business going into. But, you know, your mom's a teacher, so, you know. And uh, one time, uh, uh, as a kid, it, it, it's not important whether um, it was me or l let's just say a friend of mine. Uh, that's, that's, it's not important. Um, but as kids, you know, we were running around. Mom was cleaning some things up, you know, as a teacher. And we were running around. And you wouldn't believe it, but the, the administrator's office was open, like the principal of our little school. And so uh, naturally, it go in. And there, there's like his office and his chair sitting there, whatever. Like, who leaves this thing unlocked? So, of course, what do we do? Of course. You know, um, a, a friend of mine or, or I... Uh, uh, goes into this office, right, and immediately gets in the chair, right, and start imitating him. I'm the principal. I'm, you know, and like imitating all of his moves, right? Right when who should come out of the copy room that we didn't know was there, but uh, do I even need to finish the story? Like, does everybody know where this is going? So it's, it's of course, the principal. And, you know, of course, just why, why does a ghost? I just, I turned, why, my friend turned, why does a ghost? And I just, uh, you know, I remember looking at him like, um, you're going to kill me? then my mom is going to somehow resurrect me from the dead so she can kill me again. <laughs> and then I'm going to be like doubly dead here. Uh, but it was incredible. Uh, he was a man of great grace, and uh, he just looked at me, <clears throat> and he said, Son, I believe you're in my chair. <laughs> we will never speak of this again. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> right? right? You know? uh, I wonder if, <clears throat> in some of your decisions, some of the way you're thinking about life right now, that if the word from the Lord this morning to you is not, daughter, son, I think you might be in my chair. What do I mean by that? When Joseph says, am I in the place of God? He's saying, you think I sit in God's chair? You think I'm taking his place of authority? What do I mean by that? If you're a note taker, I want you to write down, here, here's what I did. I just got you started. I thought of a few examples, a way to unpack, am I in God's chair? I thought of four ways that we sit in God's chair, but there's countless, okay? You could probably think of other examples, but here's what I mean when I say what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with our lives fundamentally is when a human being decides he or she is going to sit in God's chair, and the message this morning is get out of God's chair. Here's a way, and this one is both very ancient and very modern. Here's the way we sit in God's chair. We sit in God's chair when we choose to be our own moral authority. Okay? Let me explain what I mean by that. When we choose to be our own moral authority, in other words, when we take God's word and we say, no, 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 no. It's, it's my word. Now, this is an ancient sin and a modern one. Let me, let, everybody knows the ancient one. If you were here at the beginning of the Genesis series, the fundamental problem, Adam and Eve, can we, their command, right? You may eat from any tree in the garden, just not the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. On the day you eat of that, you shall die. That's what they were told. Can we all just take a moment and reflect on just how short Adam and Eve's Bible was? <laughs> Don't eat that tree. Their whole Bible could fit in a fortune cookie. You understand? Like, that's it. They're gathered together on Wednesday night. Well, this week, don't eat that tree. Um, you guys want to come back for Bible study next week? No, I'm good. Me too. Great. I mean, it's not complicated. Just don't eat that fruit, right? That's it. What do we do instead? What, what, was, what was Satan's temptation? Oh, you will, did God really say, you will not surely die? You will what? You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation you become the moral authority. God, I don't like that you're the agent of authority in my life. I will be my own moral authority. That sin is ancient and it's modern. It's the same thing today. When you, the word of God, right? There are things, of course, I'm not wise enough. I'm in my, in my fleshly, of course there's things that I don't like about this book. Of course there are things I would have done differently. Of course my culture has trained me that I would have changed things. I would have never done it this way. But the short version is this. I don't get to make the rules. So I don't get to come on to Scripture and tell him what I think it should say. I have to come 
under Scripture. Otherwise, I'm in God's chair. And we put ourselves in the place of God when we become our own moral authority. When you decide for yourself what's right and wrong. The fastest way to become like Satan, ironically, is to try to be God. The fastest way to become like God is to, of course, refuse to be God. Uh, that, that's one. Just right, you know, we're getting it. What Tom means by get out of God's chair is, am I seeking to be my own moral authority? Have I sort of uh, uh, thrown off the, ah, I don't, the scriptures? I'm, I, I know what God says, but I'm going to do it my way, right? Here's another. You, you can jot this down. This one's subtle. So I offer it. I, we'll see. Uh, but it, stri- it, it strikes me. Um, I got to be careful how I word this. It's possible to like, oh, okay. Um, let's do it this way. You're supposed to help people, right? We have a lot of people in our church whose occupation is one of the helping professions. What do I mean by that? We have therapists, we have teachers, we have counselors, we have ministers, we have lots of ministers, we have physicians, we have pharmacists, we have nurses. Your job is to help people, right? We're sitting in God's chair, though, when that helping profession crosses a line to where we're helping people, to we're, we're, we are letting people come to us to meet their deepest needs that only God can meet. Now, there are parents that need to hear this. There's spouses that need to hear this. There's certainly those of us who, and I'm talking to myself here, and I, I can't explain it exactly. It happens so subtly. But there's a point when I go from, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just a guy. I can pray with you. I can teach you the word of God, and we can talk. Um, but there comes a point, I'm, I'm not the Messiah. And when I let people when I almost encourage people that I'm going to meet your deepest need, whoa, you got to get out of God's chair. The biblical example of this is um, in 2 Kings, there was this Syrian general. His name was Naaman. And Naaman was very valuable to the king, but he got leprosy. So he was no good. He was, he was on um, injured reserve. But he needed him as a starter. So he, 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 sends, he finds out there's, a, there's this healer, supposedly, this prophet over in, near Jerusalem. Go there. So the king there of Syria basically sends Naaman with a note, a letter. And he writes the letter, and he says, this is my servant, Naaman. He's great. He's very valuable to me. Please treat him with a lot of respect. Help him, and most of all, heal him that he might live. And he reads this note to the king of Jerusalem. And the king of Jerusalem does a very wise thing. You know what he does as soon as he reads this? He rips his clothes. And he cries out and more. He rips his clothes, and he says this. Am I God? Am I in the place of God that I hold in my hand the power of life and death that I decide who life lives and death is? Whoa, what you need is God first and foremost. I can't do that. I rip my clothes. There needs to be a a, a, a mental sort of ripping of the clothes. Every time you're faced with some problem, every time, you know, your your child, you see them developing and you want to be so controlling. There's got to be a moment where you rip your clothes and you go, am I in the place of God? Single people, you need to hear me say this. So many single people, they think, if I can find that husband, if I can find that wife, if I can just get married, that will fulfill my deepest needs. No, you got it. No, 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 no. No spouse is going to be in the place of God. They can't do it. So I I even tell, like, like when people are are getting premarital counseling, I say, look, if you're looking for for this person to be God to you, you need to rip your clothes, rip your collar. Just, just, just. (laughs) but Right? There's got to be this sense of, no, that can't, uh, uh, parents, right, uh, 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 to say, look, I'm going to do the best I can as a parent, but I'm dad, not God, you see. Am I in the place of God? Like I say, it's subtle. I, I hope that helps you. If it doesn't, like this week, believe me, if you're like, if you're in the medical profession and someone comes to you this week, I'm really sick. I'm sorry, my pastor said not to help you. Am I in the place of God? Like, don't do that. That's not what I mean. But there needs to be, so, whatever, let those with ears here. The, um, how about this one? When you have, and i got to be careful with this one, um, you are in the place of God. You are sitting in God's chair this morning when you have excessive worry. Now, I have to be very careful. No, no, that's not the right word. I want to be very careful here. And I want to be very careful because of this reason. I want this to be filled with mercy for you. Because if you're a person who struggles with worry, you already, by definition, are filled with anxiety. You're filled with worry. And you think, let me come to church. There, I will be encouraged. And full of worry and full of guilt and full of anxiety, you come and the preacher says, you know that worry? Yeah? That's a sin before Almighty God. And you're like, great! Now I'm doubly worried! Right? Like, that did not help! Right? You know how you're worried? Yeah, you should actually feel worse. Right? That doesn't help you, okay? 
here's what I mean, though. I, I really do want this to be an encouragement. And this is why. Everybody thinks that they're, everybody's the worrier. Everybody thinks, oh, this is for you, this is for you. We all struggle with this. But when you have excessive worry, here's why, fundamentally. When you boil it all down, the reason, and the and preachers do have to occasionally say, worry is a sin, but here's why. Here's why. When you worry, what you're saying is, I know with 100% certainty exactly what needs to happen in my life. And quite frankly, I'm not sure God is up to the task. What if he won't do it? Because I know. I know exactly what needs to happen. I know with 100% certainty, I know the things that have to happen in the future, right? So let me tell you, if you're a worrier, you got to get out of God's chair. You don't know. You don't know. Joseph knew with 100% certainty he needed to get out of that well, okay? He knew, he just knew that the right thing to happen, he would have never predicted. But that whole time, God was working his life for good. It's not that your lack of faith. Look, you, you're not smart enough to worry. <laughs> and I'm not either. I'm not either. It's not that, oh, you've got to trust God more. That's true. But we've got to trust ourselves less. Every time somebody says, my life is out of control, I said, you never lost control. You lost briefly the illusion that you ever had control. And that's what scares you. I'm saying this because I love you. I'm, I, this is a pastoral moment, right? You get it? I, I'm right there with you. But we're just not smart enough to worry. We don't know with 100% certainty what needs to happen. But God does. So when I worry, I've got to get out of God's chair. I need friends who love me. Not sarcastically. It sounds like you need to get out of God's chair. <laughs> I mean people who build me up, though, and occasionally say to me, Tom, sounds like you're sitting in God's chair. Do we need that? The... Uh, the, the, the fourth one I want you to write down, and I'll stop after four. The, the, this will be the last one because it's from today's text. When you, you're sitting in God's chair this morning if you continue to maintain a grudge against someone. That brings us to this text today. What is Joseph's clear implication? Of course I forgive you. Why? Because am I in the place of God? Of course I forgive you. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Why? Because you think I'm in the place of God? Now listen. You, you need to hear me clearly. People who say flippantly, well, I don't understand. We should all just forgive and move forward and get along. I wonder if those people have ever really been deeply hurt. Because people who have been deeply hurt, you'll never hear them say, well, I don't understand. We should just forgive and move on. It's not that simple. Nonetheless, because, here's what I mean. Joseph, no, at no point does Joseph say, you know, what you guys did to me was not that bad. Let's move on. He doesn't, does he? He calls it evil. Your deeds were evil. And the reason that your deeds are evil and I'm still going to forgive is simply this. Am I in the place of God? That's it. That's it. Now, you did not hear me say there will not be judgment and there will not be wrath. Listen to me carefully. There will be judgment. There will be wrath. A man reaps what he sows. You hear people say, only God can judge me. When people say that, I always want to grab them by the shoulders and go, that should scare you to death. <laughs> only God can judge me. Only he can pour out his wrath and eternal hell. Like, what are you saying? Yeah, God is going to judge you, right? So while I grant them that the fear of God is more valuable than the fear of man, come on, like, so, right? So, so, so the judgment of God will happen and the wrath. Here, here's the deal. Judgment will happen and wrath will happen. But unless your business card says God of the universe you got to get out of the wrath business. It's just not your job. I didn't say wrath won't happen. And I didn't say judgment won't happen. I just said it's not your job. Romans 12 says, Ven leave a little room for God's wrath. Don't take out vengeance. Why? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. You ever wonder why? Why can a human not dole out wrath? Why are we not allowed to dole out justice? Why aren't we allowed to hold a grudge, right? Why did the Bible always say... It's, be, it's several things. If you're a note taker, I, oh boy, it's getting complex. This is like sub point A, B, and C under number four. Uh, here's why. You, um, you do wrath wrong as a human, and, and God does it right. You do it wrong because you don't have the right to judge. You know why? You're just a fellow sinner. Like, how can I hold a grudge? God is perfect and holy. Who am I as a fellow sinner to stand in judgment over another sinner? Give me a break. We're both in the courtroom together. So only God has the right. Most people get that. But have you ever considered this? Only God has enough knowledge to judge accurately. 
part of why you do judgment wrong is you don't know all the facts. You ever thought about that? You, uh, you know, to li- um, where I worked uh, for, for many years was um, our, off- our church office was near family court. And I would watch these families in and out of family courts, the brokenness and the hurt. And I always think, oh, w- one of the most, even in an earthly level, one of the most miserable jobs in the world would be to be a, a divorce court judge. Because you got to sit there and you got to hear his side and her side. And you, you got, there's three sides to every story, right? His side, her side, and the truth. There's no way to truly, dif- I mean, you'd have to know. The, and you try to be fair, you try to do the best you can, but you have limited knowledge, right? You just want to know what, the only way you could be a true God, you'd have to, I mean, to be a true judge, you'd have to know everything, right? And that's, that's what God has. I mean, even in small ways, we see this play out all the time, don't you? Um, there was a, <laughs> well, um, this guy was taking a bus ride home, I heard this story from a friend, and so he says it's true, again, I don't have the knowledge, uh, but the, uh, the guy was, uh, had, had like three or four kids on the bus. The kids were going crazy. They were running around everywhere, just, just acting all crazy and uh, little kids. And finally, every, all the other passengers on the bus were thinking it, you know, passively, aggressively. But one woman actually stood up and said it, got in his face. Sir, can you control your children? Yeah, I'm from a day. I'm from a generation when we controlled our children, you know. And the guy just looks at her, and he's just like in a daze, in a fog. And he says, I'm, I'm so sorry. You're right. I just... I just came from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I, my wife is terminal, and we're deciding about whether to pull the plug, and I just, I got these kids, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, now, the whole bus is like, we'll take your kids, you know, right? Everything changes. Why? We just don't have all the knowledge. We need to judge properly. Sometimes people will come to the office, uh, uh, come talk to me about, about uh, holding a grudge, and I got this bitterness, and, and I say, well, you don't have the knowledge to judge, and they'll say, well, I know enough, I know enough that they did this, and that's enough, I mean, and I always lean in, I'm like, no, you don't, you're misunderstood, well, you might not, you might not be giving them enough wrath, you don't know how bad they did, you might be shortchanging their wrath, and you're always like, well, I, I never thought of that, you're right, <laughs> What if? What if, right? You not only are going to overcompensate sometimes, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be, the point is, you're going to do wrath wrong, because you don't have the knowledge that you'd have to know everything to get wrath right, and in just the right degrees, and in just the right amount of mercy, and in just the right amount of judgment, and you can't do it, only God can, so if you're holding a grudge, you've got to get out of his chair. And uh, also, uh, sub point C under why you can't hold a grudge, and this is the last one, is, uh, only God can deal with wrath. Only God can pour out judgment and wrath without himself being consumed by it. You can't do that. I can't do that. We start dealing with wrath. We start getting into the vengeance game. We start holding bitterness and grudge, and guess what? It begins to poison us. You start to hold a grudge. Before you know it, that grudge is holding you. And that bitterness gets inside of you. The reason a human can't do wrath is we cannot, we can't deal with wrath without it consuming us and us turning into the very thing that we were wrathful against. Only God can. Now here I'm going to take a risk. Anybody? Um, Lord of the Rings? Okay, I'll skip it. We'll move on. That's fine. Really? Some of you, you're just ashamed to admit it? Okay, right. Well, uh, for the five of you in this room, um, think about it. The whole point of the ring, right? There's this one ring that controls them all, and it's forged in the fires of Mount Doom. And the problem is the bad guy uses it. Now, you can be safe from the bad guy if you use the ring, but if you use the power of the ring, you'll become bad. It'll consume you and must be dis- destroyed. You're right. should have skipped it. Okay, got to read the room. But you get the point? If you nurse the anger, if you refuse to forgive, eventually it's going to consume you. Now. You may think <clears throat> excessive worry, uh, being your own moral authority, allowing people to come to you to meet their deepest need, most of all holding a grudge. You might think, but if I, if I get up out of God's chair, I, I, I will, I'll lose freedom. Like to come under God's commands to forgive, I'll, I'll lose control. You might think that. <clears throat> but interestingly, Just the opposite happens. Look at the new possibilities that are open in Joseph's life. He is free to see all of life from the proper perspective. Look at verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that that many people should be kept alive as they are today. It's, It's 
He's given this whole new perspective. Because I'm out of God's chair, because Joseph is out of God's chair, I, can, I have enough distance here to say what you did was evil. You meant it for evil. Yes, you're evil. And watch this. And I'm free not to hate you. I'm free to love you and to care for you. Why? Because I can see life from a whole new perspective now that I'm out of God's chair. I don't have to rule the universe. I don't have to be God to you. Um, Joseph is free. And he's free to do the impossible. Look at verse 21. He's free to actually do what Jesus said. He's free to love his enemies. So do not fear, he says. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. These are men who've done radical evil against him. Plain and simple. And Joseph repays that evil with love. You cannot do that if you're sitting in God's chair. You cannot in your own power. Now, for those of you who would say, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can do that. I don't, I don't know how. Ponder this. There is one. I mean, you know how I said earlier that um, unless your business card says God of the universe, you need to get out of the judgment and wrath business, right? And the, the point is, none of us are God of the universe. Interestingly, there was one. There was one human who walked this earth whose business card actually could have said God of the universe. There was one who did have full knowledge of every situation and could judge and condemn perfectly. There was one who had every right to pour out wrath. Remember when Je I'm talking about Jesus. Remember when Jesus was at the, 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 met the woman at the well? Doesn't he have full knowledge? I know you say you, you're not, you don't have a husband. Fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you're shacked up with right now is not your husband. M remember that story, right? Well, he knew, he knew everything. He had perfect knowledge. He uh, 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 had every right to judge. Had, he could have held a grudge, fine, he would have been in the right. And the other reason we can't hold a grudge is because we don't have the moral authority. We don't have the moral right. He had the moral right. He was God. And the only one who had absolute right to sit in God's chair left the throne room of heaven. He got up and he came as born as a little baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And he lived as a servant and he poured out and he loved and he went and he hung and he bled and he died listen on Calvary's cross he got out of God's chair to hang on my cross for us and our salvation and what does Hebrews chapter 1 say when he had done that when he was buried dead and rose again when he had made propitiation for sin in other words when he had turned aside the active wrath of God when all the wrath of God was absorbed on him and we were given his righteousness when it was mission complete what does Hebrews 1 say he did what he sat down at the right hand of God the Father the best reason of all to get out of God's chair is that it's already got an occupant Jesus is there and to step out of God's chair to release that worry to free that to remind one another hey you're in God's chair hey get out of God's chair to do that to see life from a new perspective the call is to get out of God's chair and to realize with all your heart that he alone is the Lord of all things and with this we conclude our series on the book of James Let's pray. God, grant that we would have the grace in big and small ways to get out of your chair. Forgive us when we make ourselves our own moral authority. Forgive us when we hold these grudges or when we hold to excessive worry or even if we, in some small way, allow others to look to us to meet their deepest needs. We're, we're in your chair. Forgive us of that. And grant us this fresh perspective and this fresh hearing of the good news of the gospel that we don't have to sit in your chair. The throne is not vacant. And allow us to go from sitting in your chair to kneeling at your feet. Lives of obedience and joy, worship and peace, enjoyment of you. And anticipation of your return. We thank you for the book of Genesis and we thank you for the narrative arc that it creates and begins in scripture. In Jesus' name.
We're going to have a time of response. Chuck's going to lead us. It could be that you want to respond by coming forward. That's fine. That's very common. If, if you want to, to respond by right where you're at, that also is very common. I've been in services plenty of times where I was just praying and crying out to God about getting out of his chair in some way. It could be that the Lord's leading you to take some steps, some spiritual decision. Come let me know about that or just kneel at the altar and pray. Just don't skip over a holy moment where God's dealing with you. All right? Let's all stand to our feet. Chuck, you lead us, brother. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I want you to look at somebody you love. If you can do this without being sarcastic. If you can't, just say pass. I won't be able to do it. Uh, and if you really love them and you care about them, look at them and say, hey, let's get out of God's chair. All right? Just, just do it. Just do it with love in your heart. Let's get out of God's chair.